right, well, good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Ivy Rhodes, lead pastor here, and we've been in a series called Carols. Can't believe it is almost Christmas. It's unbelievable that uh, that happens so quickly as an adult. I feel like Christmas comes at the snap of a finger. I remember as a child, it was like I had to wait years. Like the month of December was like three years long. It's no longer like that uh, because it comes so quick. So during this time of Christmas, we've been going through some classic Christmas hymns, what we call carols. And so We've uh, gone through O Holy Night and talked about that. Last week we looked at O Come All Ye Faithful and saw the upside down Christmas uh, that was uh, in that first Christmas. Today we're going to be looking at Away in a Manger and using it as a jumping off point. Now Away in a Manger is probably the most mysterious of all the carols. It was originally known as Luther's Cradle Hymn. And it was assumed to have been written by the great reformer Martin Luther. But more research actually showed that it wasn't written by him actually at all. And one reason is because there's no German version, and Martin Luther was German. That's a problem. And its earliest version is found in 1883. And if you know when Martin Luther and the Reformation takes place, that's a little bit too late. But I want you to remember that date, 1883. It's when it uh, it became apparent that Luther wasn't um, the author. And so researchers began to go to great lengths to find this original author of the hymn. And one researcher named Richard S. Hill, who is an um, academic in hymnology. Did you guys know that was a degree you could get? Anyway, he was an academic in hymnology and actually worked for the uh, Library of Congress in uh, finding these kinds of things, like figuring out who wrote these hymns. Well, um, he, he found some answers to this whole thing and wrote a scholarly article about it, one that was fascinating, and I read this past week to get this information. His conclusion, I'll, say, I'll spare you all the details, but his conclusion was that Away in a Manger was written for a Lutheran children's play and was um, developed in celebration of Martin Luther's 400th birthday, which was in what year, do you think? 1883. It's also one of the few classic carols that was originally written in English, so this is an American hymn, if you will. So anyway, take, take from that what you will. Who, the question still remains, who is the author? And to be honest with you, they haven't figured out who the author is yet, and maybe something comes up. But I have uh, learned that they have put it in the X-Files, and Scully and Mulder will be de- looking at it to hopefully eventually solve it one day. Now, while we don't know who the original author is, we are pretty sure that it was a man, and I'll tell you why, because of this line. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Only a man would see an infant crying as a sin. Uh, so, uh, that's, that's my, at least my two cents on that. Um, there's nothing in the Bible, uh, I'm just going to get on my soapbox for just a second. I'm sorry, you guys can play in a second. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that Jesus did not cry as a baby. In fact, we know that he cried as an adult. So, he cried as a baby. We'll just put it there. So anyway, that's, I'm off my soapbox and uh, I'm going to let you guys sing this beautiful hymn for us. A uh, beautiful lullaby. You can hear the lullaby, lullaby tones to it, and uh, it is a wonderful song to sing. I remember singing that one quite often in carols. Did anybody ever do caroling when you were growing up at all? Ever go, go around, knock on people's doors, and make them listen to you sing? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's like the opposite of Halloween. Um, and maybe, it, 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 never mind. Okay, <laughs> so I want to focus on uh, a few things, or one, really one line in this song in particular, and it actually says it several times. It says that, uh, that it's talking about the little Lord Jesus, the little Lord Jesus. Now, little explores the depths that Jesus went through and humbled himself to come to us, and it conveys his vulnerability. The, think about this, the hope of humanity All of humanity, from the beginning of creation until now, was placed in a little vulnerable child, in in the most vulnerable state we are as human beings. At that time, there was a 50% mortality rate for infants. Almost one in two. The mortality rate, just for comparison today, today in the U.S. is 0.36%. It's crazy to think about. And in little, we get to see the links that God went through to save us, and it shows us also that no one is too lowly for the grace of God. But we talked about that a lot last week as we talked about the upside-down nature of the gospel and the upside-down nature of Christ's kingdom. But today, I want to focus on the second two words, which is Lord Jesus. And so the main point today, if you're, you're uh, taking notes, is this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is is Lord. 
See, what we see is that he doesn't grow up into being Lord. It's not like one day at his baptism or something, as he starts his ministry, he becomes Lord. He is born Lord. Listen to what the angel said to the shepherds. Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you. Who is Messiah? The Lord. Who is Messiah? The Lord. I did a little research this week, and Lord is the title that is used for Jesus more than anything else in the New Testament. It's used uh, more than master, which is used six times for Jesus. It's used rabbi, which means te- it's used more than rabbi, which means teacher, which is used 15 times. And actually, three of those 15 come at the, um, at, at when Judas betrays Jesus because he doesn't want to call him Lord. He rather calls him teacher. It's actually even used more than Christ, which is used a lot, 528 times in reference to Jesus. But Lord is used in the New Testament 775 times. But if he's Lord, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our finances? What does it mean for our lives, our planning? And uh, what does it mean for our dating relationships? What does it mean for when we're, I don't know, coming to the end of the semester and we're finishing up our finals? What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord for our households and, and our children and ourselves? What does that mean? Well, the Greek word for Lord is kurios. And it simply means supreme authority or controller. Controller. So if Jesus is Lord, he is your controller. Now, maybe that makes you a bit uncomfortable to think of Jesus as your controller. Because when I think of controller, this is what I think of. I think of this square little controller when I was growing up. Anybody else play uh, the original Nintendo growing up at all? Anybody? I know it has to be something that most people have played by this point. So uh, this, you know, carpal tunnel was, uh, this was uh, my main reason for having carpal tunnel now. But it is, um, you know, the controller that changed everything. And what you do, if you know what this is, this is World 1-1 in Mario. Now, this world is actually kind of interesting, a little history lesson here. It was made so you could learn all the controls that you need to know for Mario. When you first start off, you have to move forward. You have to jump on or over the Goomba, and you also have to hit a question block. And that is all the information that you're going to need for the rest of... There's actually also a mushroom there that will make you big. Uh, That's all the information that you need for the rest of the game. So when I was controlling Mario, though... I would think to myself, if, if Mario wasn't controlling right, he wasn't doing what I say. You see, Mario is not his own. Mario has a Lord, small l, Lord, and it's me, right? I'm the one that controls him. So, um, uh, you know, if he wasn't following my commands that I put in on the pad there, I was going to get a new controller because I want Mario to do what I want to do. That's what I think of when I think of controller. And so that kind of idea of God controlling us maybe makes you uncomfortable. We'll come back around to that in just a little bit. But I really think the reason that it makes us uncomfortable is because we want to be in control. We want to be the master of our own universes, and we don't want to give it up. And what I realize about you guys is most of you have control issues. Me, I do not have any control issues at all, as long as everybody does what I say, and uh, as long as everything goes the way I want to go, I don't have any problems with control at all. Uh, You know, uh, Allie, if she was here, would probably be saying, you won't even sit in the driver's seat without having to tell me everything I'm doing wrong uh, while I'm driving, and that is true. Um, So anyway, we have control issues. I have control issues. So the idea of Jesus being Lord, being the controller of our lives, can be a hard pill to swallow. But how do we, let's just say, that we are going to say, you know what, it is hard, um, but I'm going to do it, I'm going to follow him. How do we make him Lord of our lives? And here's the kind of tricky thing. You don't. You don't make him Lord of your life because he's already Lord. God made him Lord a long, long time ago. You don't make him anything. What you do is you recognize that he is Lord, and you surrender to his lordship in your life. And here's really what it comes down to for all of us in the room, is we have two choices. We either surrender to him as Lord and the supreme authority and controller of our lives now, and we'll talk more about all that that means in a minute, but we surrender to him now, or 
Option two, you fight him as Lord your entire life until the time when you can't fight anymore and you face the consequences of that decision of deciding that you're going to rule your life. Let me read to you what Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Is it those in heaven? Well, it says that. It says, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's a euphemism for hell. That every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's the deal. All of us at some point will confess that Christ is Lord because Jesus is Lord. And so have you surrendered to him? Have you surrendered to his lordship in your life? Let's pray. Father, today I pray that you would take this message, you would take these words, um, you would make them powerful and impactful in our lives. God, I pray that for all of us, and starting with me, God, that we would be open to your Holy Spirit speaking to us today. We'd open our ears, we'd open our heart, we would seek to understand And not just move on with life, but actually be changed and make the choices that we need to make today in order to follow you with our whole hearts. Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord stands forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's message, if you haven't already caught on, is kind of a tough one. It's not really a Christmassy feeling message. Next week we'll get into that, especially as Christmas Eve uh, hits. It would be a little more Christmassy and feel good, but today's going to be a little bit more difficult. So just, but then we'll come around. We'll come around to some good news for sure. But for, for the, the first thing, excuse me, we're going to look at is the partially surrendered life. This is the person that is Christian in name only, that they have, um, you, know, the, you know, they're Christian because maybe they're not atheist, or they're Christian maybe because they're not Muslim or Buddhist or something else. But they, you know, they grew up in a, maybe a Christian home. Maybe mom or dad was Christian. Perhaps there's Bible verses on the wall, walls, or they listened to K-Love growing up, or maybe some CCM like DC Talk or Stephen Curtis Chapman or something like that. And they grew up in that kind of household. And sure, they're Christians. Or maybe grandma was Christian, and uh, every time you went to grandma's house, you went to church, and so you, um, you were Christian. This is the partially surrendered life. Now, the partially surrendered Christian's faith really is a background faith. It doesn't make a lot of difference in their life, although it is somewhat important to them. But it doesn't enter their mind what God wants them to do very often, except maybe when grandma gives them that condescending look when they get a tattoo or, you know, they are hung over the next day or or whatever. Um, Maybe they say a cuss word. I don't know. But they don't think much about what God wants. And Jesus is confused by this type of person, all right? Luke 6, 46 says this. This is the words of Jesus. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Why do you call me? So it's a a verbal assent, calling him Lord, and don't do the things I say. Jesus makes it clear. If he is not, he is not your Lord if you don't do what he says, Say that one more time. He is not your Lord if you don't do what he says. He may be the big man upstairs. He may be your homeboy. He may be a good example. He may be a nostalgic feeling from your past. Maybe he's a a comfort to you in difficult times. But if you don't do what he says, he's not your Lord. We want control. We don't want to give up control. We'd never say it this way, but sometimes we can live it this way. We think, you know, I'm a Christian But I'm going to keep control of this area of my life. Guilty as charged. Done it multiple times, over and over again. Jesus is Lord, but I'm going to just do whatever makes me happy. Or I'll attend church when it's convenient. You know, if I can find a parking spot, good luck. There's no parking in Jamaica Plain anymore. I've just realized that. Um, I'm sorry. I can't do anything about that. Uh, Or the weather's good, or the weather's, you know... Bad, or, but it can't be too good because if it's too good, I'm not going to want to be at church. I want to be other places, you know. We don't get a lot of good weather days in Boston, so I'll attend church when it's convenient for me. Or I'll give, I'll give God everything in my life. Everything is his except for my money and my time. <laughs> or I'll trust you with my eternity, God, but I'm not going to trust you with my marriage. Or I'm not going to trust you with my children. Or I'm not going to trust you with this or with that, whatever it may be for you. 
Or is the type of person that says, hey, he's a God of grace, you know? He forgives sin. That's, that's just kind of his M.O. And if I lie or exaggerate about this on that report or, or whatever, you know, he'll overlook it. Or if I sleep with my girlfriend, he'll understand. Or if I hold bitterness toward that person in my family or that person at work, he's, he'll forgive me for those things. He's a, he's a God of grace. And he will. God forgives. The next one I want to read is out of a version called the PSV. The PSV. This is the partially surrendered version. All right? Here we go. This is a verse out of Proverbs 3. And this is kind of the uh, motto of the uh, partially surrendered Christian. It says, trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean on your own understanding. In some of your ways, acknowledge him, and you can make your own paths straight. Now, I want to be clear, absolutely clear. If you're new to church, welcome. Uh, This is not a real verse. This does not exist in the Bible. I just want to make sure that that is clear. This is made up. It is um, uh, the partially surrendered version. But here's the deal, is we kind of live that way, but it is, um, talk is cheap. And God, what he doesn't want out of us, he doesn't want lip service. He wants life service. Or you may say that he wants the lips and the life to match up. Because Jesus isn't a part-time Lord, and he doesn't want part-time followers. I want to show you the intense and way too far way that Jesus describes following him. Like if you were going to set up a religion where you wanted people to follow you and you want to change the world, this is probably not how you would describe it. But I want you to hear how Jesus describes being a follower of him, what he calls a disciple, which is just another word for a follower. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That means to deny himself, I think that's pretty obvious, but take up his cross is a way of saying, take up the, that instrument of death. You may think of take up uh, you know, uh, some, some kind of form of uh, uh, electric chair or something, I don't know, something. It's, it, it's, it's this idea, and that's how they would have seen the cross in that day. We think of it in such a beautiful way today, and there's good reason for that. But in that day, it was a horrible, horrific instrument of death. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. There is this sense in which Jesus says, you give everything. Not some, but all. Now in this room today, all of us are living partially surrendered in some part of our life. I know this because we have not gone into eternity. We are not yet living with Jesus. And so we are all at some place in our life only partially surrendered to Christ. What is it for you? What is that thing in your life that you say, Jesus, you can have this and you can have that, but this is mine. I'm going to take control of this. I'm going to be Lord of this area of my life. What are you still trying to control? And what is it going to take for you in life to give up control of that area to Christ? So that's the partially surrendered life. and Maybe you've been there before. (laughs) I've been there before. (laughs) In fact, uh, that, that was kind of my story, is that I had partially surrendered a part of my life up until 14, and it was at 14 that I said, you know what, I'm giving him everything. Now, to, to be fair, I'm not there yet. There's still parts of my life that I'm constantly giving away. It is an act of becoming. It's an act of uh, becoming the man of God that he wants me to be, and I know it'll be that way for you, but it is at least the idea of Jesus. Whenever you show me that thing, which I am not yet giving you control, I give it up. I give it up. So that's the partially surrendered life. But next, let's take a look at the fully surrendered life and kind of compare and contrast them. This is somebody that's not a cultural Christian. There's really probably, and and you guys feel this in Boston if you're a follower of Christ, there's not a whole lot of social benefit to being a Christian. You're not a Christian because maybe your family is a Christian. In fact, maybe some of you, you follow Christ and your family never follow Christ. And so this person is fully surrendered. It's the person that has owned their faith. They've gone all in. They've died to themselves, and they have been raised new in Christ. This is the the moment of baptism. This is what baptism represents. 
Now, baptism doesn't do this for you, but it is a picture to the rest of the world that you have died to yourself and you've been raised in Christ. I love what Romans 14, 7 and 8 says. It says, For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. We are his possession. Now, I rarely, if ever, take off this uh, wedding band here. The only time I take it off is when I go to work out down in my basement, and nobody is in my basement <laughs> when I'm working out. And so um, anytime I'm around people, this wedding band is on my finger. And this wedding band is a sign to the rest of the world that I belong to Allie. Now, um, I gave her a ring too to signify that. She gave me this ring. I gave her a ring too to signify that. It was the biggest, most beautiful, most amazing ring that a 19-year-old could buy. <laughs> and it was a lot of money to me, honestly. It was a, kind of a big deal. Um, but how much did that ring that I gave her cost her? It didn't cost her anything. She, she just took it and said, yes, yes. Uh, then a few months later when we were married, what did it cost her? It cost her everything. It cost her her whole self, her whole life, and it cost me everything when I committed to her for a lifetime. See, at marriage, we committed our whole selves to each other. I gave all of myself to her, and she gave all of herself to me, and we belong to one another. She belongs to me, and I belong to her, and I can prove it to you. Can I go out with a group of women on a Friday night? Not for very long, I can tell you that. Uh, I will probably be dead before the sun rises if I were to do that. Why? Because she's taken ownership of me, right? She, I belong to her. Um, I don't even look at other women the way I look at Allie. Why? Because my eyes are hers. Does that make sense? She belongs to me too. If you get flirty with my wife, we're going to have a conversation, right? It's like, what's going on here? Stop it. You see, in marriage, we belong to each other in a similar way. Christ has offered you the free gift of eternal life. His death on the cross in your place for your sin, to forgive you of your sin, to give you eternal life, that was done without any cost to you. And he did it whether you accept him or not. It was done. And while that salvation costs you nothing, saying yes is a fully devoted, surrendered commitment. You belong to him. You belong to him. He is Lord. But here's where the, the good news kind of shifts here. And all that he has belongs to you. You see, it, this idea of him being your controller, of being your Lord and belonging kind of freaks you out. It is the greatest thing in all of the universe. And I don't, I'm not even exaggerating when I, I say that. If you belong to him, you are never abandoned, we are told in the scriptures. You are always loved. You don't have to feel guilty about your life because you have been made righteous in Christ and you possess his righteousness. You are saved from the fires of hell. You are forgiven from all your sins and you don't have to worry about it anymore. It says that your sins are as far as the east is from the west and that is infinitely far away. You are provided for. You are protected. You are eternally alive. You are freed in so many more things. The scriptures tell us that when we belong to Christ, we enter into his beautiful kingdom and a beautiful protection over us. And it is the most amazing, best belonging that you can possibly have in life. And all of that would be enough if these next parts weren't true. But I want to tell you something about yourself that maybe you haven't realized yet. You were designed to belong to him. That there is a peace missing in all of us that can only be completed when you belong to Christ. He designed you that way. And that emptiness that you feel, that, that sensation of is there more to life than this, the answer is yes, and it is Jesus. But also, not only does he design you to belong to him, he actually designed the world to work in such a way that if um, you do what he tells you to do, it actually works best. The world has been designed to, to live in the way that God has asked us to live. And we will find that when we do that, and we do it truly in the way that he tells us to, the world works best. It's livable. 
And sure, you don't get to do whatever you want. But to be honest, we've all lived long enough to realize that what we, end, what we want a lot of the times ends up pretty terrible. You know, if my four-year-old got to do whatever he wanted, we would be in trouble. There, he would probably kill somebody, you know. Um, and so as his father, I, I, I can't let him. I say, hey, you know, Augie, like, this is the best way to live. I know you don't see it right now. I know killing your brother right now seems like the right thing to do, but it's not. The right thing to do is to love your brother, right? Against what your heart is telling you right now, love your brother. I want to reread Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 again. This is the proper version. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. In all of your ways, know him, and he will make your paths straight. Know him. It's about a relationship. The reason that we don't end up surrendering to him, surrendering to him as Lord, is because we don't really know him, or we don't know him at least in a certain area, because if we knew him, we would trust him, because we know that he is good. And we know that whatever he says is actually in our best interest, and, and he is worthy of our trust. You know, think about me and Allie giving ourselves to each other. Like, Allie doesn't just uh, stay with me because of a promise that she made 17 years ago. I mean, some days, maybe that's what it is. You know, she's like, I got to, you know, I committed 17 years ago. Um, but it really comes down to relationship. That we have a relationship with one another and we trust one another. There's a trust built into that relationship. And I don't worry whether she loves me because I trust her. And I see her at work, and I know that she wants the best for me, and I want the best for her. So we trust each other. And so the places that we aren't surrendering to Christ are the places that we have yet to trust him in. Jesus says this as he continues talking in Matthew 7 about calling him Lord. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. This passage is sobering to me. I want you to look at the resume of these people that Jesus says to depart from him. They prophesy. They drive out demons. And they do miracles. This is some varsity level stuff, right? This is like, whoa. And if these people are sent away from him, what about me? They didn't know Jesus. Jesus didn't know them. And for some of us, maybe there's an illusion that because we said a prayer or joined a church at a certain time or we serve at a church or we're a good person, you know, that we're good with God. There's a big difference in calling him Lord and surrendering to him as Lord. And the account that we all have to make for ourselves is have we surrendered to him as Lord? I'm not here to say that everything you're going to do in life he, obviously, until we reach him in heaven and we are standing around the throne of God or kneeling around the throne of God, worshiping him, we will not be fully surrendered in every area of our life. So don't hear me say that you're not a believer if, you know, there's this thing. But I will say to you that if there's a thing in your life that you need to hand him as Lord of your life and you refuse to do it, you refuse to do it, not that you struggle, not that you try, not that you want to, but you refuse to. That should be a symbol in us that says, hey, maybe I haven't made Lord, made Christ Lord of my life. Christians in the room, what are the areas of your life that, don't know, that you don't know Christ in? What are areas that you have not fully surrendered to him in? You see, the difference actually in those that prophesied, drove out demons and miracles, they had thought that their lordship had to do with their actions. 
They thought that if I do the right things and I say the right things and I say the magic words when I get to heaven and I call him Lord, Lord, he'll let me through and I'll be able to come into heaven. But that wasn't what it was. It was about knowing. It was about a relationship. It was about surrender. It was an attitude of the heart that was sincerely says, Jesus, you are Lord. And you may go through life and never prophesy. You may go through life and never drive out a demon. You may go through life and never perform a miracle. And probably many of us will never do any of those things. I'm not counted out, but probably. But if you know him, you'll be with him. You're one of his children. So what are the areas of your life, Christian, that you have not fully surrendered to Christ? But then if you're in the room and you're not a believer today, Maybe you don't know Christ at all. You've never come to that point in your life. You see, he gave his life for you so you could have a relationship with him. So the, really the, the choice you have to make is will I choose to follow him or not? Will I surrender to him as Lord or not? So I want to encourage you today. If that's where you are in either of those situations, whether you're a believer or not a believer, Jesus is Lord. Surrender to him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your cross. Thank you for going to the cross in my place and saving me. Lord, today, I know that there are things in my life where I call you Lord and I don't act like you're Lord. And God, I pray that today for me, God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would give me the power, strength, and the ability to just hand those over to you. And I know that's true for a lot of people in the room today. If not everybody in the room, there is something that has yet to be surrendered. And so, Lord, I pray the same for them. God, give them the power a power that they do not possess on their own, the power to let go and let you control their lives. Let you take them, God, and let them see the beauty that comes through the fruit of their lives when they fully surrender to you. And while it seems like it would be counter, it seems counterintuitive, but Lord, in surrendering to you, we actually find freedom of life. We find freedom and, and we find beauty and goodness and love in you. So Lord, today I pray that all of us in this room, we would surrender to you as Lord. And for those that have never surrendered to you as Lord, God, they would give up everything for you. Today would be the day that they decide to follow you with their whole hearts, realizing, God, that you are good and you love them and you want the best for them. And I pray all this. In Jesus' name, amen. This media has been made available by Arborway Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts. At Arborway, we invite people to walk with Jesus together. If you would like to check out more resources, learn about Arborway Community Church, or donate to this ministry, please visit arborwaychurch.com.